the land is ours. South Africa's first black lawyers and the birth of constitutionalism by Tembeka Ngaitobi. Introduction In the blazing heat of the Bloemfontein summer of 1943, black intellectuals acting under the aegis of the African National Congress, ANC, met to deliberate the future of South Africa. Before them was the Atlantic Charter, precursor to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. They discussed how Africans might be accommodated in a new world order that could follow in the wake of the imminent victory of the Allied forces in the Second World War. From the discussions, the Africans' claims emerged. This document served not only as a response to the Atlantic Charter, but also included new normative principles to underpin an imagined South Africa that belonged to all. The group of intellectuals included some of South Africa's first black lawyers. These lawyers were responsible for converting these principles into a Bill of Rights containing basic civil liberties to be enjoyed by all, regardless of race, class or origin. For nine decades, it passed from generation to generation before it found expression in today's South African constitution. For Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a judge of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, it is not the constitution of the United States of America that is a model for the world, but the South African constitution. The magnitude of its vision and ambition is unprecedented. Coming after centuries of settler violence, economic exploitation and apartheid racism, Retribution is not the animating theme. South Africa belongs to all, it proclaims. The state must facilitate economic justice. The constitution mandate. The judiciary must protect the Bill of Rights, enforce its promises and monitor the conduct of the government. Yet, despite the admiration of the world, many of the promises contained in the constitution remain a hollow hope. Millions continue to starve, while a fortunate few enjoy the wealth of the country. Does South Africa really belong to all? In this climate of economic exclusion and social and political marginalization, where the winner takes all, some question whether the constitutional framework was in fact the correct response to colonialism and apartheid. They ask whether the very idea of a Bill of Rights, which protects individual liberties, is not animated by a fundamentally Eurocentric mindset, one that is unsuited to the African landscape. In this book, I attempt a partial answer, showing that the idea of a Bill of Rights had its origins in South Africa. Not only did the ideas germinate from the South African soil, they emanated from a group of black intellectuals and legal practitioners at the beginning of the 20th century. The idea of a Bill of Rights was a negation of colonial violence. That black lawyers conceived of it in an era of aggressive colonial expansion brings to the fore the shifting uses of law from its epicenter in Europe to the lands of the colonized. Law was not always and exclusively an expression of colonial oppression. Sometimes it was an antidote to it. As is true today. Whether law can be an instrument of justice is debatable, with a singularly important factor being the agency of the actors. In the period covered in this book, it was the personal agency of the lawyers that determined whether law was an instrument of oppression or its opposite. This is still the case today. The Bill of Rights must be enforced by an independent and supreme judiciary. Many argue that this principle too is rooted in the legal traditions of Europe. It is indeed so that the fundamentals of racial segregation in late 19th and early 20th century South Africa were laid down by Victorian politicians and the Cambridge and Oxford trained bureaucrats. But it was the colonial judges who cemented and institutionalized racism. Areas such as criminal law, the law of master and servant, the law of property, and the very constitution that flowed from the South Africa Act of 1909 
were manifestations of colonial power relations. Henry de Villiers, Chief Justice of the Cape, had a political career before going to the bench. Having served as a parliamentarian and attorney general at the Cape, he presided over the 1908 convention which decided on the creation of the Union of South Africa, where Africans, despite their protests, were excluded from government of the country. His reward was to be made the first Chief Justice of the Union of South Africa in 1911. Despite occupying this position, he accepted an acting appointment as Governor General of the Union. His reward was to be made the first Chief Justice of the Union of South Africa in 1911. Despite occupying this position, he accepted an acting appointment as Governor General of the Union. His legacy was continued by Chief Justice James Rose Engs, who in a judgment delivered in 1907, ruled that evidence tended by white witnesses was more reliable than that of Africans, a view generally held by judges of the apartheid era. Rose Inns presided over a legal system that consolidated past laws, arbitrary expulsions from land, and a compulsory labor system. His successes were no different, and it would be too tedious to recount their many perverse judgments. The point is not to cast blame on these judges, or to assume a uniformity of judicial opinion at the time. Instead, I seek to demonstrate at least in so far as the native question was concerned, that there was clear consensus and explicit collaboration between the colonial judges and the ruling elite. Africans generally encountered the legal system either through the native courts or the magistrates' courts. Both of these institutions were extensions of the executive. Colonial magistrates were government appointees, but they were also clothed with judicial power. It was African intellectuals who pressed for the separation between judicial functions and politics. They believed that only an impartial judicial branch could guarantee their freedoms against the colonial state which sought to control over all aspects of black life. Thus, in South Africa, the idea of a Bill of Rights enforced by an impartial judiciary has a long and solid pedigree. It first emerged in the late 1890s in the writings not of a lawyer but a journalist, John Tengo Jabav, editor of the Eastern Cape newspaper Imvo Zabintzund. The circumstances under which this arose warrant a brief examination. In the mid-19th century, when the jurisdiction of the native courts was severely restricted, South Africa used the jury system. However, Africans could not be appointed to sit on juries. In his capacity as newspaper editor, Jabavu received a steady flow of complaints about the lack of impartiality of the juries. Upon his own independent investigation, he discovered that it was true that blacks were more likely to receive harsher sentences where the complainants were white. His findings served as a rallying point around which he started advocating for an unbiased judiciary. Accordingly, he proposed that cases be tried and judges trained in the law and that the race of persons involved in the trial should not be taken into account. Unsurprisingly, the ideas put forward by Jabavu in a marginal Eastern Cape newspaper were ignored by the colonial government of the day. But they found fertile ground in an organization whose foundations he clearly influenced. The South African Native National Congress, the SANNC, later renamed the ANC. Its founders included three lawyers, Alfred Mangena, Pixley Kaisaka Seme, and George Munziwa. Some historians incorrectly include Richard Msimang in this list, but he was not in South Africa when the organization was launched in January 1912. As a London barrister, Mangena had a clear theoretical understanding of the argument in support of an unbiased judiciary. In his constitutional law course, at Lincoln's Inn, where he undertook his training between 1905 and 1909. Mangena took particular interest in Baron de Montesque, the French philosopher who is credited with the idea of tria politica, three arms of government. Personal liberties and freedom, Montesque believed, could only be guaranteed if judicial power 
was separated and insulated from legislative and executive power. Mangena was immediately attracted to the argument, given his own experience of political persecution in the Cape and indeed the abuse of power by the Natal colonial government in 1906, when martial law was used to justify the deprivation of fair trial rights to the Bambata warriors. As a result of Mangena's influence, a central plank of ANC policy in the early 20th century was the demand for an unbiased judicial system and equal application of the laws of the country, without regard to race or creed. This influence would also become pronounced in the ANC's response to the South Africa Act of 1909 and the 1913 Natives Land Act. The response of Africans to both these pieces of legislation was to work within the constitutional system. In 1923, African lawyers, working under the auspices of the ANC, produced the African Bill of Rights for South Africa. It contained a statement of five rights to be included in the Bill of Rights. The Bantu inhabitants of the Union, it began, have, as human beings, the indisputable right to a place of abode in the land of their fathers. Africans, as children of the soil, have a God-given right to unrestricted ownership of land in this land of their birth. Yet Africans were not the only ones inhabiting the land. Even as they made these demands, the lawyers were not yet sure of their universal application. Their demands, they explained, was for the application of a principle made famous by Cecil John Rhodes, former Prime Minister of the Cape, for equal rights for all civilized men south of the Zambezi, regardless of race, class, creed or origin. The final statement of the Bill of Rights was for representation of blacks by members of their own race in all the legislative bodies of the land. Otherwise, there can be no taxation without representation. This Bill of Rights would later serve as a galvanizing rallying point for further demands for inclusion into the government of South Africa and a share in the land. Right from these early days of resistance, black legal intellectuals were concerned about equality, justice, and a system of land allocation and administration informed by legality and fairness. Consequently, when the African's claims was produced, it included an expansive Bill of Rights. The black lawyers who were part of its drafting included Seme, a practicing attorney in Johannesburg, Professor Z.K. Matthews, a legal academic at the University College of Forte, and Lionel Tim Timkulu, an attorney in Ngobo in the Eastern Cape. Seme had been part of the founding generation of the ANC, being the organizer of the Conference of 1912 when the ANC was launched. His friend, Mangena, who was the first black South African attorney to practice law in South Africa, was elected as one of the vice presidents to John Langalibalele Dube. Mangena and Seme were inspired by the vision of Henry Sylvester Williams, the founder of Pan-Africanism, who practiced as the first black advocate in the Cape from 1903 to 1905. George Munziwa, another attorney who was a graduate of Lincoln's Inn, was elected as a recording secretary. Though Msimang was not yet in the country when the ANC was formed, upon his return late in 1912, he was thrust into the affairs of the ANC, becoming treasurer and head of the Constitutional Drafting Committee. The pages that follow record the collective experiences of these lawyers and explore the influences that animated them. As activists, they used the law as an instrument against injustice. In an age of aggressive colonial expansion, land dispossession and forced labor, they were not deterred from their goals. Rather than resorting to law in spite of the military occupation of the colonial era, they resorted to law because a military option was not available to them. Though their impact continues to be felt in today's South Africa, it is a largely unexplored topic. The focus has been the law and its absurdities during the apartheid era. However, this leaves a gap in our historical understanding of human rights and their true origins. By focusing on these lawyers, human rights and constitutionalism are restored to their rightful place in our current discourse. Constitutionalism, meaning a system of government according to laws that are fair and informed by principles of justice, did not emerge as an alternative to political struggle. Instead, constitutionalism is an integral part of South Africa's political struggle. By examining the lives of the lawyers who practiced their profession in the colonial era, 
before apartheid, we enrich our historical understanding. And in a modern era, fraught with politics of power rather than principle, we also broaden the intellectual basis of our engagement with human rights. Furthermore, it becomes clear that the unfinished struggle for land can only take place through a framework of law. By the time the 1943 conference was held, the ANC's human rights tradition was firmly established. Equality before the law constituted the central organizing principle. The Bill of Rights itself was broader than the original 1923 document. Representation was, however, still a point of contention. The 1943 Bill of Rights called for the abolition of political discrimination based on race and the extension of the right to vote to all adults, to provincial councils and other representative institutions. Judicial institutions were of special significance to the politics of resistance and the Bill of Rights envisaged the conditions for their legitimacy to function as arbiters. Freedom of the press was seen as important since the press constituted a vital platform for the expression of subaltern perspectives. The right to own, buy, hire or lease and occupy land was protected by the law without racial restriction. Compulsory education was mentioned as was freedom of trade and occupation. The African's claims has stood the test of time. As L. B. Sachs reminds us in We the People, Oliver Tambo, the venerated president of the ANC, was committed to constitutionalism. The 1989 constitutional guidelines of the ANC also reflect this commitment, echoing the views of the earlier period in Africans' claims the guidelines highlight the role of the constitution in transforming society. The effects of centuries of racial domination and inequality must be overcome by constitutional provisions for corrective action. While it is not possible to draw a straight line between the writings of early African intellectuals and the present constitution, the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955, conceived by Z.K. Matthews, had a significant impact and was therefore a momentous occasion. Furthermore, it is clear that the ideas of the first generation of black lawyers provided the intellectual basis from which later generations could draw when imagining the kind of South Africa they wanted for themselves. This still holds good today. If we are to reimagine our present and imagine our future, we should start by reimagining our past. Part 1 of this book begins the task of reimagining the past by excavating its remains from the ruins of empire on the eastern frontier. The story of how the land was lost, the story of how the land was lost there, provides a useful entry point, illuminating the larger political formation of South Africa. The eastern frontier provides a template for understanding how natives saw themselves in relation to the British Empire, the emergent racial theories of social Darwinism, which gained currency after the end of slavery, were first played out in that part of the world by a man who believed in the supremacy of the white race, Sir George Grey. His friend, Thomas Carlyle, a racial theorist of mid-19th century Victorian England, believed it was a mistake to have abolished slavery. The colonial encounter on the eastern frontier carried special significance because of the expansive network of missionary institutions. The original purpose was upended by Grey when he replaced bookish education with industrial education which was suited to native children. Part 2 examines the life of each of the lawyers who constituted the first generation of black lawyers in South Africa. In line with the conventions of biography, which follows sequential development, I focus on the events that shaped their ideas and examine their thinking during the formation and development of early South Africa, because the law was important to the world. I provide a close analysis of the legal cases they took on, the principles of law involved, and how they reconciled the law with political upheavals of the day. In circumstances where legal victories were undermined by politics, I attempt to examine what it was that sustained their fidelity to the idea of the law. By considering each life separately and drawing connections where they intersect, I try to address the broader question. How can the law be used as an instrument of justice in an oppressive society? In itself, law is never sufficient for justice. What is crucial is a committed group of actors willing to use the instrumentality of the law in aid of the oppressed. Part 3 focuses on the collective response of the individual